Good morning. Welcome to our service. Thanks for uh, adjusting your clocks accordingly and waking up and joining us for our Sunday service. Uh, my name is Paul, and I'm um, one of the pastors here. Just wanted to welcome you in the name of Jesus. We praise God for the opportunity to worship the Lord Jesus Christ as the community of saints here at Lighthouse. Um, we seek out to live the, the mission of Lighthouse each and every week, which is to share God's grace and truth so that people come to know, love, and serve Jesus Christ. To share God's grace and truth so that people come to know, love, and serve Jesus Christ. As people will start to uh, make their way in, and we're just going to... We're just going to move forward um, into our uh, call to worship. So if you can and if you're willing, can you all rise with me? And we're going to read Psalm chapter 103 uh, together, and then I'll pray to introduce, uh, to, con- to get the worship service going. Psalm chapter 103. This is the word of the Lord. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Verse 8, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Oh, Lord, what a magnificent uh, word of praise that we give to you of the truths of who you are. We come before you today to worship you, oh, Lord, our God, the, the author and the perfecter of our faith, our hope, our only hope of salvation, and the only one that redeems us and reconciles us to you, shown through, especially in this Lent season, through your death and resurrection, Lord Jesus So we come before you today as a community trusting in what Jesus Christ has done through the gospel, which is in that while we were still sinners, you died for us to bring us to a right relationship with you so that we can say, bless the Lord. We bless you, Lord. You crown us. You crown us with steadfast love and mercy and who satisfies us more than anything else that can. Lord, you are a good, good, holy, holy, holy God. And great is your love to undeserved people like us. Holy are you, O God. And with that, we sing. And with that, we hear your word. And with that, we take part in communion today to remember what Christ has done on our behalf so that we as the people of God could bring more people into the people of God and worship you. Oh Lord, would you hear our prayer? Would you hear our praises? Oh Lord, we glorify you today. We worship you in Jesus' name.
words would be true from our hearts. Purify us before you today as we partake from your bread, your body, drink from your blood. And would we revel in these intimate moments with you? to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may take your seats. Good morning, everyone. How's it going? Everyone awake? No? Please? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, good morning. My name is Paul. I'm, I'm one of the pastors here at Lighthouse. And we want to welcome you. Uh, for those who are joining us online, we welcome you. Hello. Uh, good to see you all. Uh, today we'll be partaking in communion. So for those who are joining us online, would you prepare your communion elements um, right soon? Uh, so we could get our communion started a little later uh, as Pastor Joe preaches. Um, today, uh, oh yeah, I forgot to do this. I want to right now uh, invite our children up to youth, 6th through 8th grade, to their classes. So... Um, Please go on ahead. And in the meantime, for us all here, the first announcement is we're going to show a special video right now. We've had some great Gems Mount Hermon special camps the last three years. But this year, we hope it'll be more like this. GEM Special Camp is a week-long Christian camp for individuals with developmental disabilities. The mission of Special Camp 
is to share the message and model the love of Christ to those with developmental disabilities. This is done by providing an opportunity for the developmentally challenged to experience a fun-filled time of activities in an atmosphere of Christian love. But we need your help. If you're looking for a meaningful way to serve this summer, come join us at the 2023 Gems Mount Hermon Special Camp. Uh, I'll, I'll just quickly explain. We have every year uh, during the Mount Hermon camps, uh, they're having a special camp. Uh, they do it every year, but this year they're they're going they're going they're going as you've seen in the video to try to go as back as uh, in person as possible. Uh, seeing the video here, I encourage you guys if you are willing and if you're convicted, continue to pray about this. But they need help in serving uh, the brothers and sisters, uh, our friends. Um, during, in that place, and I and I pray that you will pray, perfectly consider uh, being an aide to these special campers, which is uh, from July 2 to July 8, uh, located in northern or around the San Francisco Bay Area. So please consider that um, and pray about that. And there's a table in the back. Uh, stop by their information table after service to learn more if you're interested. It's a blessed time. A lot of our brothers and sisters uh, go and serve, and they, they're the ones get, that get truly blessed and transformed by God as they serve uh, their fellow brothers and sisters. Uh, we have our, 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 our good friend Andrew who will be in the back to, to welcome you guys. So please take a look and, and, and just, yeah, drop by. He would love to see you. Uh, our, our next announcement is our children's ministry is going to host an Easter egg hunt on Saturday, April 8th uh, for families and friends. Um, and we need any and every help possible to volunteer to help uh, help to, with this event. So if you can, please volunteer and, and contact J uh, Janet Yip from Children's Ministry or if you're a youth or anyone else that need that would like to volunteer in, in, in strike and in setup and in food preparations and in uh, helping with the eggs uh, so that children can find it, please uh, contact Janet or myself. Um, and last announcement, next Sunday, uh, March 19th, we're going to gather all of our leaders from every ministry, our small group leaders, whether it's our children's ministry, our, our youth ministry, our young adult ministry, and all the other small groups to uh, uh, plan together our next message series. So if you lead in any one of these areas, uh, we ask you to RSVP, and to RSVP, um, please contact uh, your team leader, or if you're a Vine or a youth leader, uh, please talk to me and we'll get you contacted, or we'll get you RSVP'd for next Sunday, which is right after service here at the Lighthouse Center. With that being said, Pastor Joe is going to deliver the message for us all. Thank you, Pastor Paul. Good morning, everybody. My name's Joe. I'm one of the pastors here at Lighthouse, and I'm glad that you could join us. Um, on this daylight savings time. Y'all wake up okay? Or with great difficulty? Yeah, I, I woke up with great difficulty. I realize I've got to preach two sermons today <laughs> and be there on time. Hey, uh, if those of you who subscribe to our weekly email, if you actually don't subscribe to our weekly email, please do so. We send out an email blast every Thursday or Friday, let you know what the things that are happening in the church. If you're not signed up for that, please sign up for it so you know the things that are happening in the church, um, which also requires that you open your email and read, which I'm really terrible at. Uh, but this week, uh, in the weekly email, you may have seen that there is a director of administration position that has opened up here at Lighthouse, and we are looking for a full-time 40-hour uh, person to fill that role. What does that mean? Uh, it means that one of uh, our favorite people on staff, Mei Ling Miyake, who has held down that position for decades, I was told just, it was just two decades, that, that was it, um, she will be stepping down and she will be retiring in, uh, at the end of April. And so uh, 
If you know anybody or maybe you're interested in filling that position, that position is now open. If you would like to learn more about what that position uh, entails and the responsibilities of that, go to our website, lighthousechristian.church, and I believe there's a button that says work here. Uh, go ahead and click on that and it'll show you um, what that looks like, what that job responsibility looks like. But I'm really sad. Uh, we have been going through seasons of change here at Lighthouse, and that's one of those sad changes for me that uh, one of our favorite people on staff, uh, they're all favorite people, they're all good, um, is, is stepping down at the end of April. So I'm, I'm sad about that. Um, anyway, we're going to get on with our message today, and uh, before we do that, let me pray for us. Father, we thank you and we praise you for this morning, already a rich time of worship and song lifting you up in praise. And Father, as we look at your message today and what you have in store for us, I just ask, God, that you would humble us, give us eyes to see and ears to hear, and we pray, Father, that you would soften our hearts and help us to hear you, that our hearts may be worshiping you and be worshipful at the end of this service. Father, just direct my heart, my mind, my mouth, that it may glorify you today. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of the message today is A Final Meal with Friends. And as we've been going through the Gospel of Mark, we are now reaching the end of the Gospel of Mark. We're a few weeks away from Easter. And so as we have been traveling and journeying, this is where we're at with the story of the Gospel of Mark. Jesus is going to have one final meal with his friends. Now, it's a familiar passage for those of you who have grown up in the church. It's a familiar passage for those of you who've been part of a church for a while. And so one of the things that I really want you to walk away from, as familiar as you are, I want you to anchor your thoughts on this one thought, that Jesus is rich in mercy. Now, there have been other times when I have stood up here and I said, look, when you walk out the door, this is what I want you to do. There's some instruction, there's some uh, invitation, there's some application. Today, uh, I, there will be application, but the more important thing that I want you to anchor your thoughts in as we go through this passage is that Jesus is rich in mercy. In Ephesians chapter 1, it says this, But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our wrongdoings, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Jesus, who is so rich in mercy, through his grace allowed us new life. And that's what I want you to, to keep in mind is this idea that Jesus is rich in mercy. If Jesus were an actual person and he had a bank account where it wasn't filled with money, but it was filled with mercies, Jesus would be never ending in supply in what's in his bank account. Jesus is rich in mercy. Now, what is mercy? Uh, mercy is tied together with uh, two other words. Uh, justice, which means you get what you deserve, right? So if I break the law, right, and, and depending on the size of whatever, the size of that incursion, uh, justice would be I would get what I deserve. I, maybe I would get arrested. Maybe I'd be put in, in, in jail or, or fined or something. That would be justice. Mercy is not getting what you deserved. So let's say a teenager from Chicago decides to take his father's car without permission to go see about a girl in the winter. And as it's winter, as things are slippery. And as he's coming back home after not spending too much time with the girl, is coming back home into the garage. And as he's backing into the garage, the car slips and punches a hole in the garage wall. Oddly specific, right? I don't know who this might be. Uh, justice uh, would be, son, you got to pay for all of that. Mercy, mercy would be, son, you don't have to pay for that wall. I'm going to let you free. Grace would be if the father would say, you're released from that. I'll pay for it. And you could use my car as many times as you want. Right? Justice, grace, justice, mercy, and grace. Today we're going to talk about mercy, not getting what we deserve, because Jesus is rich in mercy, has released us, removed the burden, and unshackled us. And the thing that I want us to understand as we are going through this message today 
is that the reason why Jesus is rich in mercy is not so that he could continually condemn us and point out like, this is what you did wrong. This. Uh, his mercy is because he wants us to be transformed. So mercy is not about condemnation, but it's about transformation. The reason Jesus is rich in mercy and releases us from the burden of sin and unshackles us and doesn't give us what we deserve is because he wants to have the freedom to be transformed into his image. Jesus is rich in mercy, not for condemnation, but for transformation. And as we look into the passage today, I want you to keep those two things in mind. Now, here's the other thing about the passage. Um, in the last couple of weeks, I've had you stand up and we would read the passage together. It's going to work a little bit differently today. Um, I'm going to read chunks of the passage and explain a little bit. And at the end, um, I want us to do more participation. And I want us to enter into this final meal with Jesus, we as his disciples. Okay? So for those of you with uh, Bibles or with Bible apps, I want you to turn to Mark chapter 14. Go to verse 12 and we're going to start there. What are some things that we could learn here about Jesus' mercy? And as the final supper unfolds. So let's read together. On the first day, this is verse 12, on the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was being sacrificed, his disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city and a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him and wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he himself will show you a large upstairs room furnished and ready. Prepare for us there. The disciples left and came to the city and found everything just as he had told them and they prepared the Passover. Now, does this feel a little bit like a spy movie? Like Jesus goes, I want you to go there, and then when you see the dude with a pitcher, he's walking, follow that guy. Well, what's going on there? Um, we have to remember that during the end of Jesus' time, people were out to get him. They were out to, like, literally nail him on the cross. And so Jesus has to partake and celebrate this annual uh, celebration of the Passover meal, sort of incognito. So he enters into Jerusalem, and he gives kind of like these coded messages. Okay, guys, I want you to go to Jerusalem. I want you to go there. When you see the dude with a pitcher, um, go, go and follow him. Now, the deal with the guy in the pitcher is women normally were the ones that carry pitchers. Um, so it's really unusual if a guy was carrying the pitcher somewhere. So that was like coded language. Okay, I want you to see, go to Jerusalem. When you see the guy carrying the pitcher, that's our guy. Follow him, and then go to the room and prepare the meal for us. Now, what's the meal that's being prepared? The meal that's being prepared is called the Passover meal. And it's an annual celebration by the Jews. And the purpose of the Passover meal is to remember the time when God rescued Israel from Egypt and from Pharaoh. Do you guys remember this? This is an old Bible story, a uh, thing that actually happened. Uh, God, long time ago, during the time of Moses, he went mano a mano. God went mano a mano with the Pharaoh to release his people from Egypt, from the bondage of slavery and, and uh, bondage of, of Egypt. And so he goes toe-to-toe, -to -toe, God goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with Pharaoh, showing one plague after another to display his power and his strength. And all the while he's saying, let my people go, let my people go. There are 10 of those plagues. When we get to the 10th plague, it is the most severe of the plagues. And that plague is, uh, God says, look, I am going to release this angel of death. And he is going to put to death the firstborn. It doesn't matter if you're Egyptian. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew. I'm going to release this angel of death. And this angel of death is going to kill and, and destroy your firstborn. But God had specific instructions for the Jews. He said, this is what I want you to do. To be rescued from this angel of death, I want you to get a lamb. I want you to sacrifice it. I want you to kill it. And then take the blood from the lamb. And I want you to put uh, the blood of that lamb on the doorpost. So that when the angel of death is going through the city and he sees that blood on your doorpost, he will pass over your house. So you're freed. That was a, a, a really crucial time in Israel's history. It was a really heavy time. And it's also a good time because it, it was a commemoration. It was remembering that this is the time when God showed us his mercy and released us from the bondage of slavery. So every year they would have this Passover meal. 
This would be celebrated. This would be annually celebrated. And within that Passover meal, there would be a story that, that unfolds during the meal. They would drink a cup. Then a part of the story is told. Then the, the, the dinner was, was told. Even in the dinner and the elements of the dinner, the story was told. And they would drink another cup and etc. So it was a big deal for the Jews. It was a really important time. That's the backdrop of what we enter into. That was the setting of this whole situation with Jesus and the disciples. The setting was the Passover meal. Jesus instructed his disciples to prepare the meal and to prepare the room. So let's read on. Verse 17. It says this, When it was evening, he, Jesus, came with the twelve. And as they were reclining at the table eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you that one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. And they began to be grieved and to say to him one by one, Surely not I. But he said to them, It is one of the twelve. It was one of the twelve disciples. The one who dips bread with me in the bowl. For the Son of Man is going away just as it's written about him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Jesus will be betrayed by a friend. That was prophesied, and that's the thing that's going to be fulfilled in the next couple of hours. Jesus was going to be betrayed by a friend. Jesus drops this bomb at the dinner, and it's a pretty heavy news. It's a pretty heavy thing to, to hear that he will be betrayed by one of his friends. Anybody ever been betrayed by a friend? It's a heavy thing. And Jesus drops this bomb and says, one of you is going to betray me. Now, here's the thing that Jesus does, which is, does, which is really cool. And um, Jesus points out, but doesn't point out who will betray him. I want you to think about this. Jesus doesn't name Judas. Jesus does not specifically name the betrayer. But rather, Jesus man- maintained the betrayer's anonymity. Think about that. They're all sitting at the table. They hear, someone's going to betray me. But Jesus doesn't go, oh, it's that guy. That, it was Judas. He keeps his identity anonymous. In verse 21, we are told that the betrayal was prophesied and will certainly happen and that the betrayal, betrayer will face grave consequences. Now, here's something that I want you to understand through. There's something theological that's happening here. This is one of those instances, this Passover meal and, the, and what's going to happen, where God's sovereignty, this is, it's basically God's control over what's happening, that God is in control of that, that He is somehow moving pieces around to fulfill His will and the thing that, that has been prophesied long ago. So on the one hand, there is God's sovereignty, His control. And the other thing that you're seeing here too is human will and human choice. And, and those two things are happening side by side. This is one of those weird times where side by side, God's sovereign hand ordering events to fulfill his purposes is happening and human responsibility for those events, meaning Judas. Judas somehow is still responsible for that betrayal. Here's the thing that we have to see too, that Jesus' friends react to the news. And the way that they react is probably the way that we would react, right? Like if we were sitting at the table with Jesus and Jesus tells us, hey, one of you is going to betray me. One of you is going to betray me with a kiss. He doesn't say that specifically, but one of you is going to betray me that's going to lead to my death. Now, what would be happening in your mind when that happens? I know what would be happening in my mind. I'd be like, I really hope it's not me. Who's it going to be? And, and this is the thing that happens to the disciples is, they respond with grief and with shock and with guilt and with sadness, of course, right? Uh, the person that they love, the person that they've been following for the last three years, he is going to be betrayed onto death. The other thing that happens with the disciples is that they are self-centered. Like, you know, if, if you had heard that something bad was going to happen to your rabbi, you would want to comfort and console. Like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Man, this must be terrible. What did they do? They go, I sure hope it's not me. Well, that's a, that's a nice way to comfort your teacher. I sure hope it isn't me. Surely not I. The disciples expressed more their desire not to be the one than expressing concern for Jesus' faith. Jesus will be betrayed 
by a friend. Here's the other thing. I don't want to explore this too much. That when Jesus pointed out that he was going to be betrayed by somebody, he doesn't name it specifically who it is. That's a little bit curious. Why does Jesus do that? I, I think it's sort of similar to, you know, like if, if you were part of a family, you have other siblings, and somebody in the house, you know, broke a plate or, or you took one of the cookies they weren't supposed to, and your mom goes, I know somebody who took the cookie. And maybe your mom knows who took the cookie, but your mom's not saying who it is because she's waiting for you to come out and say, I took the cookie. I think something is happening around that too, that Jesus somehow is pointing to Judas and sort of like giving him a chance. I know one of you will betray me. It has been prophesied. And I think what Judas, Judas could have done in his free will, he could have maybe during the meal kind of set aside and maybe he could have turned and, and repented. I think Jesus was giving him an olive branch. But he doesn't. So let's read on. Verse 22. While they were eating, so the meal was happening, while they were eating, he took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it, and he gave it to them, and he said, take, take it, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is being poured out for many. And truly I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine again until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God, foretelling that at some point Jesus is going to eat that again with his bride. But what's happening here? What Jesus is doing is that Jesus is redefining what the Passover meal is. Now, this is a monumental thing for us as followers of Jesus that we have to remember that the Passover meal used to be about that time in Israel's history when they were freed from Egypt, they were freed from Pharaoh. But what Jesus is doing here is he is redefining what this meal is. That it's no longer about freedom from the bondage of slavery in Egypt, but it is now going to be about the freedom from the bondage of sin and, re and, and wrongdoing. So the bread, Jesus holds it up, and he says, look, this, this bread that I'm holding up, he says, this is now the body, uh, this is my body broken for you. Because in past times, the bread, which was unleavened, no yeast, it represented the haste with which uh, Israel left Egypt. But Jesus is redefining it, and he says, okay, see this bread? It's no longer about that. This is what this is about. This is my actual body. This is the symbol of my body. And when he broke it, he said, this is my body broken for you. And then he, he passes it around. And, and Jesus is redefining this meal for the disciples to let them know, I am going to die for the many and my body is going to be broken for you to receive. This is an offering up of my life. So he redefines the bread. He also then redefines the wine and what it symbolized. Uh, Jesus redefined the wine. The wine was sort of like this, this, this sweetness. This is part of uh, the, the meal, the Passover meal, where you would have uh, this sweetness of, of the wine. And, and, but Jesus redefines it, and he says, it's no longer about that. You know what this, this cup is? This is now my blood. And, and it's not just the blood. This is the blood of the new covenant. And so he takes this cup, and he does a couple of things with it. He says, this is my blood poured out for the many. Now, what does that mean? In Moses' time and even in Jesus' time then, the blood of sacrificial animals was poured out by the priests on the altar as a sin offering to atone for the sins of the people, which means uh, even during Jesus' time, uh, especially during this festival, that there would be a, an, an animal that would be sacrificed for the atonement of your sins, to, to die in place because you need to be forgiven of your sins. And the priest would take the blood and he would sprinkle it on the altar. But now Jesus is saying, well, that's not the way it's going to be anymore. It's not going to be about that animal. It's about my blood. This is the blood now. This is the blood that is poured out for you. Second thing about this blood is that Jesus' blood inaugurated a new covenant. This is the deal. This is sealing the deal. The blood inaugurated the new covenant, and Jesus' sacrificial death is a covenant-making event, making a new act of redemption, and it begins a new relationship between God and people. 
right? So there's this old covenant about the blood and the bulls, and that was the old way that we were going to do it. Now he's saying this is now the inauguration of the new way to come. One that supersedes the old. In Leviticus, we're told that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And it's true. And now Jesus shifts and he says, now instead of the animals, it would be my blood. And then the last thing that he says about the blood and the cup is that this cup is going to be shared in community. Now, Jesus does something here that is not COVID-friendly. At the meal, (laughs) Jesus takes the cup and he introduces it. And then after he introduces it, he goes, pass it around. All of you drink it. Not COVID-friendly. Like, you go, no, I'm not touching that. But Jesus passes it around. Why does he do that? Because all the disciples drank from the same cup. They entered into a communion with the one who would shed his blood, with the one that who would die. And so what, what, what's happening at that meal is, yes, there's a new, a new inauguration. There's a new covenant. There's new happening. But also Jesus is sort of saying, this is now the new community. This is my community. Right? So when we partake of the, the blood, or the blood, when we partake of the bread and the juice, we say this is, an, this is the thing that we do as followers of Jesus. And it's not meant to exclude people who are not followers of Jesus. It's this is what we do as his followers. We partake together because this is the community centered around the brokenness of Jesus' his body and the blood of his, uh, the covenant of his blood because we are now forgiven and made new. The Passover meal was redefined. Here's the last thing uh, as we read the last section. Let's read verse 27. Or verse 26. And after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Why, what's the purpose of the singing of the hymn? After the Passover meal, uh, usually the meal ended when everybody sang songs. Like that, that concluded the meal. That was the official sign that the meal was concluded. So the meal was concluded. Jesus is singing uh, with his boys. And now the end of the meal has happened. Um, and after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, this garden, uh, this olive garden. And Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. That's a prophecy. But after I'm raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. But Peter said to him, even if they all fall away, yet I will not. I mean, you sense the pride and the arrogance, right? Arrogance much? All these chumps, they're going to fall away. Not me. Watch. Watch. Jesus brings him back down to earth. And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, that this very night, before a rooster crows twice, you yourself will deny me three times. Boom! Back down to earth, Peter. But Peter repeatedly said insistently, now if you had heard that, you would think, let me humble myself. Peter just kept insisting and repeating, not me, not me. He says, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. He just repeats it over and over again. And then the final sentence, and they all were saying the same thing as well. Jesus will be abandoned by other friends. It's not just Judas. It's not just the one that was prophesied that would betray him. It was also prophesied that all of you are going to scatter. All 11 of you that are here with me, When I am crucified and when I die, you will flee for your life. You will hide. You will scatter. You will abandon me. That's some heavy news. But, but there is, there's sort of like a glimmer of hope in there. We're told that after he is resurrected, he will meet up with them again in Galilee. So as bad as that abandonment is happening, Jesus, who is rich in mercy, said, you know what? Let's meet up again in Galilee after I have arisen. Now, let's talk about Peter. Peter is right on cue, and he speaks up impulsively, and he says, look, even if they all fall away, I will not. And he's given this sobering news. You're going to deny me three times. You're going to show people that you are ashamed of me three times before the night is through. Jesus will be betrayed by his friends. Anybody ever here ever been ashamed of somebody? Anybody here ever abandoned anybody? What do we do with this story? 
What do we do with this story? Uh, we enter into this story as somebody who participates in the event. That you and I are his disciples, for those of us who have said yes to Jesus. And we sit at the table with Jesus, with the twelve. And at that table, a lot of things are happening. There's a lot of things to notice and to see and to hear at the table. I want to go back to the original thing that I told you, that Jesus is rich in mercy. Before we sit at the table, we've got to remember the character of God as we sit at this table. What does that character of God look like? Uh, Psalm 103, Pastor Paul mentioned it in his opening prayer. Let me read you a few verses. The Lord is compassionate and gracious. He is slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always contend with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. Verse 9 in another translation, I love the, this translation, says, uh, he will not give us as, as, as our sins deserve. Isn't that amazing? That's the compassion of God. He will not always contend with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our guilty deeds. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. So I want you to lock that in. This is the God that we have. He is full of compassion. He is full of mercy. He is sitting there at the table, and you're sitting there at the table too. So I want to pause here. As you are sitting at the table with Jesus, what's happening in your life right now? What is the movement inside your heart? I know some of us, when we came in here, we are more tired, maybe from, from other things, maybe more than just the, the daylight savings time. Maybe some of us, we go to the table because we are exhausted about life. Maybe some of us go to the table because there's things that's eating us up. We go to the table with the king. Maybe some of us have experienced great joy. That's great. We bring that to the table with the other disciples. What else is, in this, is at this table? When we go to the table, I want us to examine our hearts. There's four things I want us to do. The first is examine our hearts. That as we go to the table, where is our heart right now? Are we filled with anger? What's happening there? There are, there are things that's happening at the table, and I want us to examine our hearts. First, there are hidden sins at the table. Judas. Not being forthright. He knows there's something that he's got to do, and it's going to lead to death. He has a hidden sin. Judas also has a hardened heart. He, he, he has seen his master uh, uh, three years. He, he's seen him. And for some reason, we don't know exactly what happened. Jesus may be disappointed Judas to, to such a degree that he says, you have unmet expectations, Jesus. My heart is not hardened towards you. I don't like you very much. I, I've seen some things that you've done. Maybe it's great, but now my heart is hardened towards you. And I'm going to sell you out. Maybe some of us come to the table that way. Maybe our hearts are hardened. Maybe we've seen things of Jesus and he has disappointed us and we have unmet expectations and we come to the table with a hardened heart. Third thing, maybe some of us go to the table and we have a self-centeredness. You know, like it's all about me. You know, the, the whole, the universe orbits around me. I'm in the center. And maybe that's how you've been living. I want everybody to orbit around me. I am the most important person in my life. We see it with the disciples. It's not me, is it? I mean, I mean the thing that's going to happen to you, Jesus, is bad, but I sure hope it's not me. Self-centeredness. Maybe for you, there's pride and arrogance. That maybe you're going, ah, I'm not going to be like one of those chumps. Those people are below me. I'm better than those guys. They're going to sell you out, but I'm better. I'm more theologically sound. I have shown myself more faithful. Uh, I, I'm stronger, and I'm a better disciple than everybody else. And all those guys, they're going to fall away. That's pride and arrogance. Maybe you come to the table with pride and arrogance. Maybe some of us come with grief. Maybe we have heard of somebody passing in our life. Maybe we are experiencing that now. 
Maybe it's the grief of a loss of a relationship. Maybe it's the grief of somebody who is terminally ill. We know that the end is near. What do we do? The disciples felt that way too. They brought their grief to the table as well. One is we examine our hearts. The second is we confess our wrongdoings and we unshackle and unburden ourselves. When Jesus brings this up that somebody will betray him, I think he was wanting Judas to turn back. I think he wanted him to confess, but he doesn't. Second thing is we confess our wrongdoings. The third thing is return to God. Man, if Judas had just returned to God. Fourth thing is we receive forgiveness. So we examine what's here. We say, God, these are the things that's happening and these are the things that I've done. Let me confess that to you. And as I confess that to you, let me return to you. And then as I return to you, there is the surety of your forgiveness. Let me receive it. Let me receive your mercies. Let me receive the richness of your mercy. Now, that's a lot of talking on my end. Here's what I want us to do. I want to participate at the table. And I want to guide us through just what those different elements are. Examining our hearts, confessing our wrongdoing, repenting and returning, and then receiving forgiveness. I'm going to invite our worship leader to come up here and, um, and to just play some, some background music for us and give us, really what I want to do is I want to give us some space. I want us to give us, to, to have some space where we just examine our hearts and walk through. We come to church, yes, to worship Jesus, absolutely, to praise Him. But I believe God is working on all of our hearts as well, wherever we're at. And I want to give us this time, and I want to give us this space to just be with Jesus, to sit at the table, to examine what is happening in the soul, uh, in my soul, what's happening there. And then the end goal is for you to worship and to receive forgiveness. So I want to walk us through this. I want to guide us. And then we're going to, I'm going to introduce communion. And I want you to continue to have time with God. So this is what I want you to do. I want you to sit up straight. I want you to just put both feet on the ground. And maybe if you could just unfold your arms. And let me walk you through being at the table. Lord, I pray that you would help us to examine our hearts. Your word tells us, search me, God, and know my heart. Put me to the test and know my anxious thoughts. And see if there is any hurtful way in me. And lead me in the everlasting way. In this moment, we ask God that you would reveal to us are there hidden sins in our lives? God, is our heart hardened toward you? God, have we placed ourselves in the center of the universe? Are we pridefully and arrogantly treating our brothers and sisters? Maybe there is guilt. And God, some of us are dealing with grief. The loss of someone we love. The terrible news that things could be terminal. So Father, in the next few seconds, we ask that you would examine our hearts. Examine our hearts with us. And now in the next few seconds, 
Let us confess our wrongdoing. In 1 John, we're told that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous so that God will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, in the next few seconds, we just confess all of our wrongdoings and our sins to you. Lord, we are sorry. And now let us repent and return to God. In Acts, we are told this, therefore repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And now, Lord, as we have examined our hearts and brought to you the things that we have done wrong, we return to you. We know that when we return to you, it is the best place that we could be because you wipe away our sins. You refresh us. You cleanse us. So, Jesus, we return to you. And now, God, we receive your forgiveness. As we have brought to you the things that have burdened us, shackled us, we come to you knowing that there is surety of forgiveness when we come to you with with the things that burden our hearts. Your word tells us, in him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our wrongdoings according to to the riches of his grace. And so, Father, we receive your forgiveness. Father, we thank you and we praise you that we have a space and time that you've given us this time to come to you with the things that burden our hearts. Maybe maybe we rejoice in your forgiveness. Maybe we rejoice in the richness of your mercy and in your grace. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you as followers of Jesus to the table today. And you'll notice that We have the communion elements up here. There's one station here and one station there. And I was having a conversation with a friend earlier this week, and and, um, I was told maybe we should do communion a little bit differently today. And so before the pandemic, we would have stations set up here and and kneeling pads, and we would partake and take our time. Um, Obviously, after the pandemic, we can't do that. Um, But I want us to have this time where we partake of communion together and to do it in a way that we are, we are not just opening this little container, but we are with God. We are there with Him, communing with Him. And so after I introduce the elements, uh, my instruction for you is to go form a line on this side, this outer side aisle, and there's another outer side aisle over there, and just form a line and, and come on down. We have the elements up here, and this is what I want you to do. First is just take your time. This is the moment, hopefully, that you will take your time. Uh, But come on down, and you could do a couple of things. You could uh, pick up an element, and you could bring it back to your seat, and you could just spend time there and soak in the worship and, and just time with God. You could do that. The other thing that you could do is you could take an element, and and maybe you just want to take some time to pray. So take an element, and I want you to move over to the side and just just pray up here. That way we can have some room for other people to pick up an element and and just spend some time. And and this is my instruction for those of you who are married or maybe you have a significant other in this room. Maybe you could use this time that after you take an element, communion element, move over here and maybe just hold your spouse's hand 
and before partaking of the communion together, just pray. Just pray together that you are one with each other, but also you're one with God, communing with Him. Offer up a prayer and then partake together. And then when you're done, just go on back and, and return to your seats. But the thing that I want you to do to, to keep in mind is just take your time. Uh, we, we haven't been able to have this kind of time together in a long time. Just be in the presence of the Lord. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread. After he blessed it, he broke it, and he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the meal, he took the cup, and he said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. And Paul said, look, as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. May that proclamation be with you as you spend time with the Lord in communion today. Let me pray for us. Jesus, I pray that we would never forget that you are indeed rich in mercy and that you are full of grace and mercy for us. And Lord, it is a humbling thing that somebody would die on the cross for us and that you would be resurrected and we would be reminded of new life in you. Father, I pray that you would use this time to remind us of your mercy and your grace and the new life that we have in you, in your son, Jesus. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're not able to come up, uh, just please raise your hand. Our ushers are going to come and, and give you a cup. Uh, I forgot to tell you that also at, uh, over on the sides, we're going to have people who would be praying for you. That maybe as you started this discussion during the sermon, that you feel like, I need to be prayed more. Or maybe you just want a prayer of blessing. We're going to have some prayer people over to the side, and they'd be more than happy to pray for you. So at this moment, I just want to invite you to come up and partake of communion together.
powerful to make sin and shame retreat. This covenant is making me whole. So I will rise and lift my head, for by his mercy my life was spared. The highest name has set me free because of Jesus my heart is clean purify my heart in your presence and teach me to discover the joy of holiness that forms as you draw lost is restored so I will rise and lift my head for by his mercy my life was spared the highest name has set me free because of Jesus my heart is clean because of Jesus, my heart is clean. Because of Jesus, my heart is clean. that was spilled for us so undeserving we rely on your mercy we rely on your grace and Lord we thank you for the death that was on the cross for us that when we receive it we are given new life and that when you were resurrected you took us with you we too were resurrected and I pray for my brothers and sisters, for myself as well, that the things that we travel through and journey, that you would remind us that you were present with us, that you are good, that you are merciful, and that you are full of grace, and that you are not out to condemn us, you are out to transform us into the likeness of Jesus, that we may love and forgive and offer mercy to a world that needs it. And now, brothers and sisters, may the love of the Father, may the leading of the Spirit, and the peace of Christ be with you today, tomorrow, and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you for joining us and worshiping with us. Uh, I'll be back there at the welcome table. I'd love to talk to you if you're new, if you have just visited our church. Uh, there's a way for you to also give your tithes and our offerings on our website as well as an offering box back there. If you want to continue to be prayed for, we're going to have people over to the side so you could receive prayer. But thank you for joining us. Have a great rest of the day.